let's see. After today, we have two more weeks of classes. That's four more lectures after today. Um, what I plan to do is not necessarily go the full distance because we're in a good um, point as far as material goes, but give you plenty of time to work finishing up your assignments and have a few activities for things that won't, aren't necessarily a graded assignment but would be um, interesting things for you to review. I'm going to look at the book today. I'm going to point out a few things in the book um, that I'm not lectured on but are valid things for um, possible activities next week. So you don't have an iPhone, by the way. Do you have an iPhone? I have an iPod. Does it browse the web? Yeah. Okay. I may ask for you to do something with it later. Because okay. I was trying it with the Android and it wasn't working, so I'm not really sure what that means. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is chapter 9. Well, let's back up. Chapter 8 talks about phone gap and phone gap build. But the one thing they talk about that we have not covered in class, we just really went through a very generic example where you took an HTML5 uh, web page and did that. There's actually libraries that comes with phone gap that you can download to your machine to take advantage of some of the um, other features of your device. For example, and this is covered in this is covered in chapter 8, the phone gap uh, chapter. But there is um, a way that you can actually hook on to the camera and do something with the device. All right. And if you look at it, it starts on page 345. And it shows some JavaScript to do that. Now, one other thing I want to mention is these are, these are all loose ends, and, and it's sort of a credit to, to your class this term that in previous semesters we haven't really gotten this far. All right, so it's good that we can handle some of these, I hesitate to say minor topics, but maybe less critical topics. We use jQuery mobile in this class, all right, to get the appearance of um, a, a, an app within our web pages. jQuery mobile itself is built on top of just plain old jQuery, all right? Is anyone familiar with what jQuery is? We know what jQuery mobile is. We know that jQuery mobile is built on top of jQuery. But what does jQuery do? Well, I'll tell you. jQuery simplifies some common JavaScript functionality that you may do. So again, sort of in, in painting the, you know, in setting out the direction of the first over the next couple weeks of class, one of the things we may look at, and one thing I would encourage you to look at on your own, is look at jQuery stuff. Because jQuery allows you to write JavaScript more quickly, easier, however you want to put it. Sort of a framework for JavaScript, if you will. All right. Um, but if you notice, I'm starting on page 345. And if you look at the code that's on 346, the code that's on 346 is actually using sort of the jQuery aspects of jQuery mobile. But what, in essence, what this section is doing, and we'll review, and again, we might have an activity for it, it would be fun to sort of experiment with this, is to allow you to tap into your device's camera via a phone gap library. All right? So they talk about on page 345 the phone gap JS, which is a file that you can download from phone gap. 
and you can use the API to go and do some things like use a camera and so on. So it starts on page 345 and it goes to the end of the chapter, I believe. Yeah, it goes to the end of the chapter. That might be something we will look at doing as one of the, I'm thinking of sort of like activities to do instead of lectures over the last few weeks of, of class. That's one activity definitely that could be on the horizon. Chapter 9 talks about how to be future friendly. All right? And if you look on page 358 of the book, they talk about mobile web, web strategies. And if you remember way back in the beginning of class, I said one of the things that is sort of, I don't want to say tough about this class, but this class is all about building within you a set of tools that you can use in different situations. All right. Think of all the things we talked about. We talked about responsive web design. We talked about two forms of responsive web design, using the progressive enhancement or graceful degradation. Both of them sort of end at the same place, but they take a different route to get there. We've also talked about having a separate mobile website. We talked about device detection, media queries, Werfel to find more information about the device. We talked about using jQuery Mobile to get a certain look. We talked about using PhoneGap build to build a mobile application. We talked about offline support of caching pages. And we talked about using, even though we didn't do an example, but we talked uh, a second ago about using the PhoneGap API to access the camera and so on. So these are a lot of techniques. Does every problem require every technique? Of course not. It's sort of your job to look at the particular situation, identify when you would do one versus the other. It's likely on the final exam that I would have questions concerning like, when might you use graceful degradation versus progressive enhancement, for example, and so on. But the one thing they talk about is making this future friendly. And they have this cute little future friendly manifesto. All right. And what they're trying to do is develop sort of a mindset going forward because we know there's going to be things that change. All right. Already there are Google Glasses. Already they talked about the iPhone watch and so on. When this comes, it's going to change things around some more. How can you build pages without knowing what's coming in the future? Well, you can't specifically, but with a particular sort of mindset, you can develop things in a way that are more ready for future enhancements. One of the things they said is, you know, and there's a beautiful chart on page 367 that talks about mobile first and content like water. All right. We know we can't be all things to all devices, but we can focus on what matters most to our customers and our businesses. Really focusing on the essential stuff and the stuff that's important. And it goes down the line to discuss that. So this is a good chapter to read. I don't think there will be any activities out of this chapter. Um, so yeah, we probably won't hit um, any activities, but that is a good one to read. Now the interesting thing is in Appendix 1, they have the list of the top six things that they did not cover in this book. They did not talk about testing on mobile devices. We did that sort of, right? I brought different mobile devices, but 
If you notice, if I'm not mistaken, all the mobile devices I brought to class were Android devices. All right. I suppose I could have brought an a iPad in to test some things in. One thing that's kind of clever in this section that they talk about is they say, visit your local mobile testing center. What is your local mobile testing center? Do we have one in Lorraine or Lorraine County? No idea? Well, they're just trying to be clever. What they're saying is, is go to a mobile phone store and pick up and try to visit your site with an iPhone, with an Android, on the guys that you're shopping for a phone. You know, you'll have to, uh, you, you know, you might have to scare away a sales rep, but that would be one way that you could go and you could test your your uh, uh, website on different devices. There are remote testing services, and there are where you can do some tests online. There's even these, uh, there is even a version of these for just plain desktop websites where you can go and it will show you um, what your site would look like on a variety of different devices. We did talk about the emulator. The emulator is good, but it only sort of takes you so far. Really, to do a true test, you want to test on a variety of platforms. The last thing they talk about is important, and that is to prioritize your testing. All right. There will always be stuff that you didn't think of, and there might be potential issues on obscure platforms. All right. But when you're testing a mobile web page, you can prioritize pretty much what you're testing on. For example, iPhone 4, 5, and 6, I would say, it would be one of the priority items. A few of the newer versions of Android would probably be that. Yes, on a Windows phone that's running an old version of, of mobile Windows, you might have an issue. But again, theoretically, I can tell you your job is to build a website that works in all situations. But the practical matter is, is that it's important to prioritize when you're testing. That's important if you know something specific about your customer, for example. If you know your customers tend to be skewed towards one platform for another. If you're doing for the general public, though, you can assume probably a fairly even split between Android and um, iOS. Page 376 talks about remote debugging. And this is where I might ask you to try your iPod. Because I tried this all afternoon, and I'm not getting it to work. I may also try this at home when I'm on my network. Because it's possible they have certain things blocked on the network here, and I'm not able to do the stuff that I want to. But debugging on a mobile device is difficult, both an app and a web page. It's much more difficult to do that than it would be to do that on a desktop device. All right. So what they allow you to do with this remote debugging um, is to go to a desktop site that can set parameters on your mobile device. Let me show you how this is supposed to work, and we'll see if it does work this way. This is covered in page 376. And if I can find any success at all with this, this will definitely be an activity we'll do over the um, next while. The, URL, the URLs are a little different than what they described in the book. The name of this is either Winery or Wiener, depending on how you pronounce it. It's W-E-I-M-R-E. Page for it, Web Inspector Remote. Now, this is 
supposed to be the page that you can go to. Now, you can set up a server on your own, or you can use their free public server. All right? What I'd like you to do is go to this website. I'll put the URL up big so that you can see it. Yeah. Do you have it already? Yeah, it's up. Okay, good. This is similar to what it ran in my office. So you're on that page that has the green bar, the red bar? Okay. There's a slice of code that contains JavaScript that is supposed to connect it to this server. So I should be seeing the device here. But clearly we're not. Let me give my phone one last shot at this. If I can find that. I left at my office. Well, mobile devices aren't an issue. I usually have like 10 of them with me. So. You want to be on the client page, though, not, not this page. You want to be on the one that has the. Uh, the one that says uh, the minimize or not minimize. Either one of them should be okay. Either the minimized or, or not minimized. The minimize came up for the one that you're on now. Is it? Yeah, um, that this one definitely won't won't work. So. So this is a page, this is a demonstration. We should be able to debug this page using this monitor, but it's not recognizing it. And I hit refresh. Let's try it again. try this at home to see if there's some quirk with our network that's keeping it from working. The idea is, is you should be able to, some documentation on it, you should be able to go in and if this is the, the, the web page running on a mobile device, you should be able to go in on the desktop client and manipulate attributes of it to go and change some things here. So it's sort of a way to say if it's not displaying the manner in which you expected it to, you could go into this winery server, connect your device to, the, to, to that, connect your server to your device, 
And then you can look at and debug that way by changing settings and, and that until it works. So I'm not really sure why it's not working. I'll do some uh, investigation on it. If I can find uh, a way to get this to work, we'll definitely have this as, uh, as an activity. Um, so, so far the two activities I like to do would be the phone gap, integrate a camera into the web page, and this as a debugging tool. Next thing, determine what browsers support what. This is good advice for any web developer, not just people in a mobile context, but it's good for anyone. There's a great website called Can I Use? that shows all the different elements of CSS and HTML5, as well as FVG, which is a, a, a graphics, JavaScript, API, and so on down the line. So for example, can I use a canvas in HTML5? A canvas in HTML5 is like a little area that you can draw on. It's for animation and other things. So if I click on canvas, it will show me the versions that support it. All right? In other words, the canvas attribute will not work in IE8, but it should work in 9, 10, and 11. Should work in Firefox from 31 on up, Chrome from 31 on up, and so on down the line. The color coding sort of shows you, um, gives you an idea of, of how good the support is for it, if I'm not mistaken. Green means it's supported. Red means it's not supported. This kind of weird green means it's partially supported which means on the Opera Mini browser, it partially supports it. Now the good news is, is you could look at it and actually see the percentages of people that, that use this. So, for example, IE8 is not supported, and globally that's 3.18% of the users. So, If we look at that, this doesn't add up to 100% because I'm sure there's some oddball browsers out there that um, they don't include in the totals. But if you use the Canvas basic support, 90% of the users are running a browser that will support it. Now you have to decide, is that a big deal? What can you do if they don't support it? Well, you have a number of options. And we learned about the device te uh, uh, detection techniques and so on that you could use to possibly show them different content. Uh, let's find another one. Um, form validation. In HTML5, there are ways to validate form controls without writing JavaScript. You can, for example, say on an input that is required. The problem is, is not all browsers support them. IE 8 and 9 doesn't support it. Firefox and Chrome support it. Safari kind of supports it. And so on down the line. This one, if you notice, is a little riskier. This one, 73% if you use this feature, we'll have at least some support for it. So you're kind of talking about a quarter of the people out there if you use this. So by knowing the percentages, you know how big of a risk it is if you use that. Let's find something 
that I really would think would be maybe not too widespread. Oh, that's about the same, 74%. Video is pretty well covered. Um, yeah, there's a good one. Maintain method for establishing and maintaining functional boundaries between down trees and how these trees interact with each other within a document, thus enabling better functional encapsulation within the DOM. That's going to be on the final, so I hope you have that memorized. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding about that. Notice that again, this one again, only 46% uh, of the browsers support it. So if you were using that, then you probably don't want to, um, you, you, you're liable to have difficulty with that. And there's CSS stuff too, putting box shadows on there, 90%. Now, does that mean that if your browser doesn't support it, the question then is, is what happens? Does it degrade gracefully? In other words, if I try a box shadow in CSS and it doesn't work in a particular version of the browser, i.e. A, what happens? Does your page blow up? Is your page unreadable? Or does it just not look as pretty as it does in the newest version of IE or Chrome or whatever. That's something that you can test as you go and go back. But in order to test this, you have to know what you're up against. All right? And you have to know what your priorities are for support. Um, and, and uh, you know, if you know something about the population of your users, then you can, you can tell based on this browser chart some good information as well. If not, you can just go with the basic percentages that they show here. Can you just write validation to say if you're using this browser upgrade or whatever? Um, opinion you shouldn't require someone to upgrade a browser. All no, right. I'm saying something like this, you know, that's minimal. Right. Say somebody is using IE8. Right. Just have them pop up a modal message saying like update. Or you, you could you could put something on the on the screen that says um, you know for an optimal experience do you know do this. But ideally even if they didn't it shouldn't break. I guess is what I'm saying. Device APIs, we're going to sort of skip that. And the last thing is on page 386, which talks about a brand new acronym, RESS, R-E-S-S, Responsive design plus server-side components. Essentially, that's what I've been teaching from about the first or the second half of the, the term on when we started about talking about doing things in PHP. All right? Um, that's one inadequacy I think is found in this book, is this book does a really good job talking about responsive techniques, but it doesn't talk about in any great detail some cool stuff that you can do on the server side. All right? that can um, address the issues that you have with mobile websites. <coughs> things like doing an include file, things like using Warful. I mean, I guess it does talk about that, but in my mind it could go further. Again, the point being that all these different things that we have are tools in our toolbox. All right? And it's your job to look at a given situation and decide What's the best mix of these tools to, to use? You shouldn't do something because you know that code better, if that makes sense. In other words, you should look at something and say, I'm going to code this via PHP because I'm more comfortable with PHP than I am with CSS, or I'm more comfortable with PHP than I am with JavaScript. Um, 
and I, I've heard and I've seen developers take that approach. I don't think that's a good approach. Your approach you should take is the one that works best for the particular problem that you're facing. All right. So if a problem that you're facing is best addressed via JavaScript, then you do it via JavaScript. And if you are weak on it, they'll give you an opportunity to practice it some. All right. But at the very least, you should be familiar with the tools and have a basic understanding of them so that you can build on them. All right. So over the next couple weeks, we'll have probably, uh, instead of lectures, we'll probably have sets of little mini activities. And I do want to give plenty of time to um, wrap up um, the work that you're working on. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's head down the lab.